Well, good evening, everyone. Um, my dad is a Southern Baptist pastor, and so I'm typically used to call and response, and we are in a Baptist church today, so good evening, everyone. Good evening. <laughs> awesome. Thank y'all. Um, it's so amazing to see such a great turnout. Um, thank y'all for spending some time here with us. Um, for Please come in. Uh, for the district, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> um, for the District 6 open house. Um, the intention of tonight, one, is for um, you all to give very important updates from um, our city departments, um, and equally as important for you to get some one-on-one -on -one time with departments that are here um, about issues or topics or projects that are of interest to you. Um, I just want to, first of all, um, not only welcome you, but um, just say how excited I am about um, all of the good things that are happening in District 6. Um, I know you've heard the news about recent development and who's purchasing what land. Um, and I just want to highlight really quick um, that um, we have been focused as a council office and as a district on ensuring that we're bringing neighborhood commercial um, and commercial opportunities to the district. Um, we've heard you all loud and clear on the kinds of uses and we're working diligently to do that. Um, whether it's at uh, Sycamore and Summer Creek, um, the shops at Chisholm, um, y'all have heard a number of the news um, and we're proud about the medical offices we brought in, child care centers, um, uh, retail and restaurants. Um, there's a Chili's coming to the district for those of you who like their chicken strips, they're pretty fantastic. <laughs> um, but non non needless to say, um, your input um, as uh, our neighbors is really important in ensuring that um, we are delivering not only excellent city services, but delivering um, for District 6 um, developments and economic opportunities that um, we all, um, you know, want and love um, to have around our neighborhood. So I'm really, really proud about that. I'm also really honored for all of the um, folks that we have here participating in the open house um, and want to highlight a few. We have Crowley ISD um, that's here. Um, Crowley ISD, wave your hand. Uh, I'm a proud uh, alum of Crowley ISD. I went to Crowley Middle School and North Crowley High School. I see your North Crowley shirt. That made me smile. Um, played football there as well. So I'm really excited about all of the amazing things happening with Crowley ISD. They have information on their upcoming bond um, that'll be happening just a few weeks away. Um, so make sure to check out their table and connect with them and ask whatever questions you have related to that. Um, the second um, organization, community organization that's here in addition to city departments um, is our uh, United Way team. Um, they are specifically here representing a new initiative that the city and the county partnered with United Way um, to deliver on, in, and it's called the One Second Collaborative. Um, it's really important to me, um, not to get emotional a little bit, um, because um, when I first took office, um, I went to a funeral um, of a young North Crowley student who was on his way to t uh, Texas Southern University on a full ride. Um, and to see his football helmet, the same one that I wore, sitting on top of his casket, um, life ended too soon due to gun violence. Um, I promised myself that I would do everything within my power with you all um, to ensure that um, we have the resources in place to keep our children safe. And so the One Second Collaborative um, is a multi-million dollar investment uh, from the city um, and also the county partnering um, to establish a coalition that addresses and prevents youth gun violence in partnership with um, important departments like PD um, and also with community organizations, community centers, churches, um, any organizations who are specifically um, working with kids to address and prevent youth gun violence. So super proud they're here. They could do a lot better job at explaining that than I just did, but um, thank you all for being here to educate the community on um, the opportunities. If you have a nonprofit um, and you do that kind of work, whether you're watching online or whether you're here in person, please be sure to connect with them at the end um, so that you have information about the important um, opportunities that um, are a part of that collaborative. Um, with that being said, um, we will go through a very brief um, agenda, um, but it's going to be highly informational and you will have opportunity to engage as well. Um, we'll have important updates from our transportation and public works department about important um, transportation projects um, that, are com uh, that are happening in the district. Um, we'll hear from the Fort Worth Police Department about safety initiatives um, and to give you a briefing on that. We'll hear from Code Compliance, our Parks and Development, I mean Parks and Recreation Department, um, and also our Public Engagement Office about 
um, how to um, report your issues to the city when you see them. I use the My Forward app 100 times a day, um, and I will continue to use it 100 times a day because that's my responsibility as a, a neighbor of District 6 to make sure that if I see something, I say something so that the city can do something. Um, and so that will be our um, agenda. Um, each department will give you a five minute briefing and then we'll, I know it's gonna be short, but you have five minutes for a question and answer period um, after each department gives their briefing to you. Um, if you don't get your question in, have no fear. The departments are here um, and they will be able to connect with you after uh, the presentation portion um, for another 15 to 30 minutes. Um, if you don't get to connect with them, we all have information um, that we'll give to you so that you can connect with us um, after the event. Um, two more announcements and then we'll get the show started. Um, I want to recognize my staff for you all so that you know who are your point persons. Um, Davia Johnson um, is our district director. Um, she handles all things related to policy, zoning, scheduling, administrative, uh, that type of work. Um, and also Mr. Joshua Rivers, he's our constituent services director. Uh, he's going to be your best friend if you have issues that you want to report. Not only should you report it to my forward that, but you can also um, notify Mr. Rivers and we'll make sure to also help, help you navigate your issue. Um, the last announcement um, I will make before I'm sitting down is um, I just lost it. And that's what happens when you have a four month old baby. <laughs> <laughs> I will come back. Um, but the important part is you're here and our departments are here. Um, so without any further ado, I will bring up our Transportation and Public Works Department um, for them to give you a, a briefing. Thank you all. All right, guys, good evening. Thank you so much for coming out. Your public engagement means the world to us. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about our bond projects. But I'm Lauren Preer. I'm the new Director for Public Works. Not to be confused my, with my predecessor, we look alike and talk alike. Um, but I'm so glad to be here. Tonight, we're going to talk primarily about Vision Zero in our high injury network. So our Vision Zero strategy is really about eliminating traffic fatalities and si serious injuries. So Chelsea St. Louis, she's one of our senior capital project officers in our transportation division. She's gonna cover that and might get into Harris Parkway. I think that's been a hot topic. Uh, go easy on her, I'm her bodyguard. Um, and then we also have Ms. Lisette Acevedo. She is our senior capital project officer for capital delivery. So her group is charged with building all of the bond projects. Uh, no easy feat and talking about the bond project. So we're already talking about a 2026 bond program. Uh, so start getting your wish list together. Uh, as I've talked with a couple of y'all tonight, it's really a quantitative and qualitative an analysis that goes into creating these lists, but your public engagement is critical to the end result. So with that, Chelsea. I'm a senior capital projects officer in our transportation management division. We have responsibility for everything related to maintenance of the uh, transportation system. So that includes your traffic signals, street lights, sidewalks, pavement markings. Um, we handle programming for safe Russell school projects as well as school zone maintenance uh, and sign maintenance, general sign maintenance as well. And so why Vision Zero is really important it really gets to what Lauren just mentioned about having a data-driven approach uh, to be able to identify the safety needs uh, across the city and having an objective way to identify projects for investment. And so in 2019, City Council really made that commitment to Vision Zero by adopting this resolution uh, that commits the city to developing a Vision Zero strategy um, to eventually get to zero traffic fatalities and serious injuries in the city. In 2020, we followed up um, and we actually identified the high injury network, which you can barely see on this map. My apologies. Um, but this identifies all of the corridors within the city that have the highest frequencies of um, fatal and serious injury crashes per mile. And so from uh, the high injury network, there were a few corridors, McCart, Alta Mesa, and one of the frontage roads are for Loop 820 that actually showed up in the high injury network. Next slide, please. And so uh, from identifying those priority locations, we actually did roadway safety assessments on two of those locations. So in a roadway safety assessment, you pretty much go out to the field. Um, you also look at crash data and reports and crash diagrams to figure out what actually happened to uh, cause the crash. And then you identify countermeasures to prevent that from happening in the future. And so we did the RSAs on Alta Mesa, and, uh, well, it, there was only one. It was Alta Mesa 
where we did the, the larger uh, roadway safety assessment. And from that assessment, we identified uh, projects that needed to be implemented to improve safety along the corridor. And so uh, one, um, one 2022 bond project is Alta Mesa Boulevard at McCart that was already programmed in the 2018 bond. So really the roadway safety assessment we completed in 2020 just reaffirmed that that was a need that we needed to be addressing. As well, in 2022, we identified another uh, signal location that needed reconstruction. And so we added that to the 2022 bond as well. And there are some other improvements um, that are underway in uh, District 6 that we'll be talking a little bit about, um, Lisette will be speaking to a little bit. Next slide, please. So in addition uh, to what we've been doing with the high injury network, um, and the projects we're talking about really today are ones that will bring near-term relief. Um, but in, in order for us to really address all of the traffic safety issues that we hear about every day, like speeding, the reckless driving, um, distracted driving, we really have to identify uh, projects through a, a full transportation planning process that gets us to that. So understanding the needs citywide, we applied for a Safe Streets for All grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation. We were awarded that grant and we are working right now to get an agreement with USDOT so that we can start that planning process. And so with the Vision Zero Action Plan, we'll be identifying a suite of programs, projects, strategies um, that we can implement holistically in the city to increase uh, traffic safety and eventually get to um, the goal of zero. And then also there is a McCart Avenue study that will be uh, led by our regional mobility and innovation team to look at um, what are the needs on McCart Avenue, get out to the, to the public and understand how you want it to function. I know we, we've talked a lot about speeding on McCart Avenue. Um, so this study will look at, okay, what does that mean to you? What are you willing to accept? There's always a trade-off. Um, thoroughfares are built to move higher volumes of traffic at higher speeds, and this helps you during your peak time, um, but that changes if we're talking about reducing speeds. Um, so we'll be talking about those trade-offs that the community will accept as we move forward with those planning efforts. Um, and with that, uh, our schedules are forthcoming for those two planning uh, studies, so look out for that. And I'll turn it over to Lisette, who'll talk a little bit uh, in more detail about the specific bond projects. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisette Acevedo, and I'm the Senior Capital Projects Officer in TPW for Capital Delivery. Um, we manage a multitude of different kind of programs, arterials and mobility, etc. So today we're going to be touching uh, on some key projects that are in your district. Our first project, which was identified with our Vision Zero High Injury Network Analysis, is Alta Mesa and Macar Avenue. This project received funding from the 2018 bond to um, to reverse those left turn lanes and create uh, a bigger separation over those left turn lanes and to um, be able to improve the timing through there and as well as uh, relocating those towers. I don't know if you guys, you know, are familiar, but, you know, we have these really large Encore towers that are very close to the intersection and uh, vehicles are constantly crashing into those towers. So we're partnering with Encore uh, to be able to also relocate the towers further away from, you know, the edge of roadway. Um, this project also received a state funding. Uh, in 2020 from the State Department of Transportation. It's called a, high, um, it's called a program, high, Highway Safety Improvement Program, that is focused on addressing you know, uh, severe collisions. So this intersection obviously you know, had a large number of collisions, so it received federal funds. And so that has delayed our start of construction a little bit, but good news, they are ready to start construction uh, this spring. So you should be seeing some activity at this intersection. Please be patient. Construction, it's inconvenient. Uh, the next project that I want to touch on is a 2022 intersection bond project, uh, South Uland Street at Risinger Road. Uh, we're currently um, uh, fast-tracking design. We're moving towards 60% design on this intersection and acquiring easements. Uh, because we, we're very anxious to get this intersection uh, into construction. It's going to reconstruct the street. It's going to you know, provide additional uh, separation among the left turn lanes and improve side distance and um, navigation through the intersection. Uh, the next steps are for us to execute a design contract later this fall around November. And uh, last but not least, uh, we want to talk about our McCart slash uh, McPherson project. Um, this project uh, was approved in the 2014 bond program, 
and uh, we completed the design somewhere around 2019, and then since then we've been trying to acquire right away. Uh, so the good news is that we have began, got approval to condemn the property, and we have a hearing for one track of land this May and another one in the fall of this year. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well, great. I'll be in the back if you guys have any other questions. <laughs> Thank y'all, thank y'all, thank y'all. Um, I know some of y'all may also be wondering about a number of improvements on Risinger. Um, there's been several uh, stop signs added um, because of input from you all, um, and TBW has been great at responding to that. Um, and I know some of y'all have questions specifically about Harris Parkway. Um, know that our office is especially um, uh, concerned about Harris Parkway as well. Um, Joshua Rivers has done fantastic with working with residents like Joe um, and the Great Hearts Lakeside on that. So um, please connect with us later on that and we'll give you an update. Um, um, at this point, we have Chief Aldridge here um, who will give us um, a briefing on PD safety initiatives in the district. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Robert Aldridge. I'm the Executive Assistant Chief with the Police Department. First, I want to thank you for being here, taking time out of your day. I mean, everything in District 6 is important to you or you wouldn't be here. I know crime and safety is one of the biggest things that are probably on your mind. You want to feel safe in your house. You want to feel safe in your community and be able to do the things that you want to do. Uh, before I get started, I want to introduce, of course, uh, Commander Andre Smith, his MPOs, uh, the MPO sergeants over there. If you do not know your MPO, you need to know your MPO. Uh, those are the ones that are going to get things done for you in your division. So let me just give you a brief update of kind of our violent crime. Uh, April 2nd of last year, we started our violent crime initiative, and the whole purpose of the violent crime initiative was to reduce violent crime across the city. The previous two years, we had seen some, you know, troubling increases across the city, and we wanted to do something to try and curb that activity. So we took a little bit of a different approach this year and we started focus, focusing not only with cameras, I don't know if you guys are familiar with flock cameras, but surveillance cameras. Uh, flock cameras read license plates. Uh, we can put warrant hits in there, stolen vehicle information. Uh, it gives us the, you know, the ability to track these vehicles across the city. One of the other things we did is that our beats are pretty big within the city. We have about 96 police beats in the city. But what we did was we broke the crime down into our police reporting areas. They're very small subsets of these beats, and we have 834 police reporting areas in the city. And what we did is we dissect the crime down to that level so we can put the resources in those areas to address those issues as they come up. So last year, um, we were able to see a 13% decrease in violent crime. Uh, which is really, really good. I mean, that's what we wanted to see. Part of the initiative is we wanted to see at least a 10% reduction, reduction in crime. We also saw a reduction in homicides. Uh, we went from 118 down to 101 homicides. We don't want to see anybody get killed. We don't want to see anybody get hurt, but we surely don't want to see that number go up. Now, I know those are citywide numbers, and I know you're like, okay, great. What happened in District 6? So in District 6, there was a 50% decrease in homicides. And so whenever you look at the aggravated assaults, those went down by 14%, and then the robberies went down by 13%. So, I mean, we had some pretty significant changes, you know, in the violent crime that's occurred across the area. One of the projects that we kind of put together, and it was kind of, you know, spearheaded by David Cook, our city manager, he said, listen, you know, crime prevention is everybody's problem in our city. So not one department should have the lion's share of everything that's going on, that everybody can contribute to crime prevention. It doesn't matter if it's code compliance, the libraries, uh, TPNW, um, it really is irrelevant because honestly, the police department cannot arrest our way out of a crime. We can't. We need the community's help, we need the other department's help. You would be amazed if we just change a street light or get a street light working, what a preventative measure that could be. So we started a pilot pro project down in Alta Mesa and McCart, and basically we kind of concentrated in that area because of some of the violent crime that we saw. We brought all the city departments together and basically said, listen, start providing resources to this area so we can tr try and improve this area so maybe more businesses would move in, people feel safer in the area, and we can have some you know, uh, good strides with reducing the crime that goes on here. Now that program's still going on, we're still meeting monthly about that, um, but we've had some pretty good successes in that area. So beyond the violent crime, I know one of your guys' biggest concerns, speeding. Speeding and accidents. You got, you know, McCart, 
Uh, you got, let's see, West Risinger, Columbus Trail, and Summer Creek are one of your biggest freeways out there that people like to race up and down. Um, again, if you do not know your MPO, get to know your MPO. I personally know Tiffany Hayes, the MPO, John 18's beat. She adjusts her hours all the time to try and adjust or uh, address those speeding concerns and speeding issues. There are other MPOs in the district that do the same thing. They are able to also connect with our traffic division to come out here and run details. Speeding is a concern for us as well, but it's a citywide issue. It's not just a South Division issue. It's not just a District 6 issue. It, it, it is a concern for us. Um, for some reason, since COVID's happened, people are now out and about. It has been a few years, but it seems like they've kind of forgotten how to drive. And they definitely have forgotten how to be respectful drivers um, because we're seeing an alarming number of road rage incidents, you know, along not only our freeway, but our surface streets as well. So we'll be here to answer questions. I mean, our staff will be here afterwards. I'll answer questions now if you have it. Um, but I know there's quite a few other presenters to come up. Yes, ma'am. Harris Parkway South can be a racetrack. Okay. At night. Um, and, and not all the time, but sometimes in the middle of the night. Yes, ma'am. Wakes people up. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll definitely uh, make sure somebody at least addresses that. Any other questions? No? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, a lot of people uh, do donuts a lot, like, around our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of vehicles across the city that do donuts, and most of those people that are doing it, they don't live here. And so, you know, we call those street takeovers because they take over intersections for a short amount of time, and they disrupt everybody's life, and they cause actual chaos. Now, we do have our directed response unit that is actually, we kind of task them with attacking that problem. Um, the problem is, is that a lot of these groups go underground and they use private social media sites and it takes us a little bit to catch up with them. So they may hit one or two intersections before we can get onto them. But I can assure you that's a big problem of ours as well. And you know we're doing our part to try and make sure they stop doing that. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Before that young gentleman leaves, I have something for him. That was an amazing question. So I'm going to give you a Molly pin, and it's an official pin of the city, and I'll give you the one that I wear because I'm keeping the seat warm for you, okay? Um, at this time, we'll have code compliance come up, and we have Brandon Bennett um, who will give us a briefing on code compliance. Thank you all for coming out. Like everybody else, uh, Manya is reminding me I have five minutes. I get very windy. Um, that way I don't get a lot of questions at the end. Uh, no, seriously, um, code compliance is your junk drawer department. If it doesn't fit any place else in the city, they put it in code compliance. So I've got a lot of good staff here tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk about just two topics, but I want you all to know when this is over with, if you have questions or concerns about solid waste, about environmental protection, about restaurants and their cleanliness, about general property maintenance, code violations, things like that. Uh, and I got animal control back there if you want to talk to them about that. I, I encourage all of you to, to, to visit with my staff uh, and they'll help you out on whatever your, your concern is. Next slide. So shopping cart ordinance, right? You all don't have shopping carts down in this neck of the woods, right? That, uh, uh, you know, we are one of just a few cities now uh, in the nation that has a shopping cart ordinance. It's to address uh, situations like this, and uh, you probably have it even worse uh, in your neck of the woods. Uh, so what we did was, next slide, is uh, we went and we looked at best practices across the nation, uh, and we came up with a system of things where we don't make it a strict ordinance that if you are a business owner with shopping carts and your cart is out on the street, we're gonna immediately write you a ticket. And the reason why we didn't do that is most of the businesses that have shopping carts, uh, they don't want the carts to leave the parking lot in the first place, right? So they're somewhat of a victim also. Uh, so we wrote it in such a way that we said, you have a responsibility to drive the neighborhoods and pick up your carts, first and foremost. If you fail at that, and we notify you that there's a cart out there, uh, we're gonna give you 24 hours to pick it up. Uh, and if you don't pick it up, then we're gonna take it and we're gonna impound it, no different the way we would impound maybe a car. Um, uh, and, and then when you come to get your cart, you're gonna have to pay us a fee to get your cart back. And we did that because we want the businesses to proactively drive the neighborhood and pick them up before you have to complain. 
And then when we give them notice, we want them to have the incentive to go pick up their cart before we take it away from them and they have to pay us money to get it back. We have a number of businesses, unfortunately they are national retailers, um, that uh, despite this type of effort, and this doesn't even go into effect till, till July, but we've been somewhat um, beta testing it. And we have a number of the, the, the major retailers, well, one in particular, I say a number, there's one in particular. Um, and I'm not gonna mention it. Did someone say Walmart? Oh, <laughs> what a good guesser you are, but I'm not gonna mention it. Uh, <laughs> Where, you know, we, we, we've, been, we've been calling Bentonville uh, to their corporate folks. We're, we're just frustrated uh, with, with some of the things that we've seen, and, and some of those have been in your neck of the woods down here, that even after we call them repeatedly, they're not going out and picking up their cards. So um, if they are a repeat violator over and over and over, we also wrote into the ordinance that we can require them to put wheel locks on their carts uh, and do other things. Uh, and other things could be in, in some uh, parts of the nation, uh, businesses are required to have a cart um, custodian that's required to drive around the proximity of the store in the neighborhoods every day and pick up the carts. Uh, and so, and again, we don't wanna be too punitive on this. So if that's what we have to do to get their attention over a period of time of them complying, then we'll, we'll pull back some of those regulations and reward them for, for better behavior. As this rolls out a little bit more, y'all, if, if you get uh, the city news or some of the news feeds and stuff, uh, we have a tool online where you can um, look up like an Albertson cart. You can go online and type Albertsons and your address or the address where it's at. It'll give you the name of the manager and a phone number to the store. So we're gonna be looking for volunteers to helping us because we didn't add any staff to this. So the people that will be enforcing this uh, will be your, your general code officers, your restaurant inspectors, uh, just, just employees as part of what they do every day are gonna be asked to do a little bit more. So anything we do to get you all to help us, there'll be more to come on that uh, down the road. So the other thing that I was asked to talk about tonight is short-term rentals. So these are your Airbnbs. Um, has anybody been following council and, yeah, ah, got it. <laughs> that means you get, right? And, and again, after this is over, because it can get complicated, I would encourage you to, to, to talk with me or my staff. So a short-term rental is this, it's real, it's real simple. And short-term rentals, we all think these Airbnbs are new. They've been around for a long time. I've been in local government for 43 years. And I can tell you, they, we've been dealing with stuff like this for that long. What we haven't seen is mainstream with the internet and booking and things like that. So they've become even more popular because they're more, they're, they're more convenient for people to book them and stay in them. And that, that's why you've seen the explosion. So in the state of Texas, like almost every state in the nation, if somebody writes a lease for 30 or more days, that is not a short-term rental. That's just a rental. So what these folks can do legally in any district in the, in, in the city where, where residential housing is allowed, they can, if they do it right, about 12 times a year, they could rent out their house and be legal. Now, most will tell us they only do it that way, but there's different people staying there every weekend and we have a way to, to, to catch that and enforce that. But I want you all to know, there are, there are some that literally do that, that one weekend a month, they rent it out for a little extra uh, income. And oftentimes they actually live there um, or they have a secondary dwelling unit. So they rent out the main house and they stay in the back house. Um, so some of the things that, that have happened of late on, on short-term short rentals have had a lot of conversation, and I, I wanna make sure that I, I get this right. So I'm not gonna read the slide verbatim, but kind of give you maybe a, a, a top-down explanation that there are some zones in the city where short-term rentals are allowed by right. That means if you, if you have a house, if you have a house in, in that particular zoning district, and you want to make it a short-term rental, you don't have to do anything special other than register it with the city and pay a hotel, uh, an occupancy tax, hot tax. That's all you have to do. You don't have to get a zone change, uh, none of that. Most of the time where we get complaints though are in single family residential districts and that's where most of you probably live. Um, and in a single family residential district, if you rent out your, your house like this 12 times a year or once every 30 days, that's lawful. 
but the minute it goes below 30 days, more than you know, once in 30 days, then that's illegal. None of that has changed. Over the last year, there's been a lot of council conversation, and at the end of the day, they decided to leave it alone and keep that illegal. So what we have, some of the tools that we have right now um, are all of you, number one, that if you have a short-term rental in your neighborhood, you can use the Fort Worth app to report it, or you can call the call center and report it, and that will generate a response from a code officer. What you need to know is we do not proactively go after short-term rentals. To us, right, we don't have, you know, I would have to triple my staff if we were going to go after every short-term rental out there. So it's kind of like when someone does uh, 60 and a 55 when they're speeding. The odds of them getting pulled over or drawing the attention of a police officer are pretty slim. There are lots of short-term rentals that people don't even know about in their neighborhood because they're managed well, right? And they, they keep everything flying under the radar. So we're not gonna go and try to seek them out. There are other short-term rentals, maybe in your neighborhood, where they're having parties and they're idling their cars and, and there's trash and you know all these nuisance things that are, that are drawing attention to you. Uh, maybe there's not keeping the property up and it's, it's impacting your livability or your property value. Those are the ones that, that, that we want you to call about. And then what we can do is we have data mining uh, capability where we can go uh, and look at their bookings, their recent bookings, their future bookings, uh, and we can build this case. And sometimes when we're building the case, we have to ask you, if you're the complainant, to keep a log for us of vehicles that are coming and going. Uh, but I'll tell you, because one of the nice thing about being the junk drawer department is I have animal control officers that work in the middle of the night, and they can help the code officers out by going and knocking on doors and seeing who answers. Most of the tenants that stay in the illegal place, they don't want any trouble with the law. They'll, they'll just answer the door and say, I'm here for a couple of days. So if the officer just does it this weekend and the next weekend, we know it's a violation and we move on. Um, the penalty for it is we can write a citation each and every time the, the, the window or the, 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 the face value of the fine by ordinance is $2,000. Um, we could write that every time we see a violation. We typically will write it three to five times uh, and let it go to trial uh, and see how we do at trial. We tend to, uh, when we do trials, we have an option to do all five citations at once or do them individually. We typically do them individually um, and we do that so that each case is heard on the merit of the case. But we also do it because that way they have to come back five times, they have to bring a lawyer five times, and they have to pay a different fine five times. And, and we do that because we want them to become legal. We don't want a, a fine, them just to pay a fine and continue to operate illegally, right? Because that impacts impacts all of you. I think at the state, there's, I, I don't think there's anything cooking right now. I, I could be wrong. There, there's been some committee meetings and stuff, but I think at some point the state legislature may bring this up again or take this up again. A couple of sessions ago it almost passed uh, and the local jurisdictions pushed back pretty hard and said we should have local control. Our residents should decide and their elected officials should decide whether these are legal or not. I think that is the Next slide. Yep, that's it. I know I was five minutes over, so I probably should go and nope. <laughs> Any questions? AJ, where'd AJ go? No question? <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, well, thank you for having me, and I encourage you to talk to my staff here when we're over with. Thank you. At this time, we have uh, Parks and Recreation, um, and Scott's here. Hey. Good evening. Uh, I'm Scott Penn. Uh, I'm the Senior Capital Projects Officer for the Park and Recreation Department, uh, responsible for capital delivery of park improvement projects throughout the city. Um, as this evening, that's my task, so, uh, but we definitely have a lot more divisions in the Park and Rec Department, so if you have questions regarding recreation programming or golf and athletics programming or maintenance, mowing, litter, uh, those types of things see me afterwards I'm pulling double duty so I'll be at the table by myself uh, but I can get you in touch with the appropriate people in the park department uh, so to discuss a couple of active projects we have in district 6 right now um, we have a, a three four reserve sites three reserve sites Parkwood East Trail Lake Estates and Deer Meadow Parks uh, you might have seen some of them are already under construction Deer Meadow Park is already under construction Parkwood East and Trail Lake Estates will be before the council on April 23rd to award a construction contract so it will likely start construction around June 1st. Um, those are reserve sites, so there's nothing built on them correct right now, uh, but they'll consist of a playground and some trail connection items. Uh, I think Parkwood actually has a, 
a shelter associated with it, and Trail Lake might have a basketball court, half court associated with it as well. Um, we have some playground replacements that are going on currently, and all four of those are in construction right now, uh, and they're scheduled to be done by the end of the summer. Uh, they're lumped with seven sites, so these four happen to be in District 6, uh, but they're paired with three others, so it's a full contract. So they probably won't be done until the end of the summer as they'll wait to install the rest of the stuff. When we have two that are at schools, Overton and Daggett, so we're waiting until the school's out in, in May to, to disrupt that, that area. Um, and then we also have some pond dredging funds from uh, the 2022 bond program. Uh, so that will be used at French Lake. We, and currently that's in construction, uh, but uh, there's four sites associated with that one, but we were able to do a co-op agreement to be able to get this done faster. So it'll happen this spring or summer, um, along with Oakland Lake, uh, Pecan Valley Golf Course, uh, and Greenbrier. So next one. Thanks, David. Uh, these are some planned projects. Actually, West Haven is uh, currently being designed right now. Um, the drainage improvements, we're actually doing a study uh, right now system-wide for the park department, a drainage and erosion control study. Um, so we're going to wait until the study's returned. It'll set aside, uh, select the items of criteria to weight them for, and then prioritize the sites where we need to spend some of the bond dollars that we got for drainage and erosion control. Um, so CP Hadley will definitely be considered as one of the ones that we're going to spend some of the initial 22 don bond dollars on for drainage and erosion control improvements. And then we have five sites here. Uh, for security lighting and they're lumped with 26 other sites uh, due to you know obviously trying to get some efficiencies and cost for both design and the construction delivery part of it um, so the, that's part of the big package that we're just now securing design services for uh, these are some of the recently completed projects uh, that we've done uh, Candle Ridge Park drainage and erosion control uh, that was actually done in conjunction with TPW stormwater uh, but it was with park 2022 bond dollars um, and you can see it on the right over there, the channel before. That's at Sunday Place in Misty Meadow. Uh, and then the after uh, is directly next to it. Uh, Hewland Meadows is a small playground and some site furnishings, picnic tables, cookers that we did. Uh, South Meadows is kind of, it's kind of bisected by a creek channel so people can't get to the big playground on the other side from one neighborhood. Um, so this one's on the other neighborhood on the other side of the creek channel. Uh, and then of course, Chisholm Trail Phase 2, which was the skate park. Uh, that recently, that, but that was phase one, but phase two just recently got completed about three or four months ago, so. I believe that's it. I, I definitely want to take the opportunity to echo Lauren's sentiment that uh, about these meetings, these things are so important to us and I'm so happy that y'all showed up tonight. I know we've done them for the bond program in the past, um, but I think council, council member Williams and the rest of council, I believe are on board with doing these more frequently so that we can get kind of an update throughout the year uh, from the citizens about ongoing projects that are currently going on, if there's an issue or if there's not an issue, uh, as well as to collect data for future bond programs like Lauren alluded to in the 2026 bond program. Joe, any questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, we, <laughs> right now we, we have, we, we, we've been doing a lot of pickleball, but we're converting tennis courts to pickleball, and I understand that that's, uh, it's frowned upon amongst the, the diehard, uh, the pickleball clan, but uh, we, I think we have 19 courts right now um, that we have on the list to get done. We've done nine, and that's, again, conversion of tennis courts. Uh, we have not constructed just straight pickleball courts, uh, but I think that that's definitely in the future. Uh, for some of our community park planning and larger budgeted projects to, to work that amenity into it. Uh, we have master plans going on right now at Oak, Oak Grove Park, Gateway Park, Sycamore Park. So we have the opportunity to start programming those things in on the master plan. And so it's coming and we're going to keep converting tennis courts at least two to four a year uh, for pickleball purposes. So it'll be double, it'll be double striped, but Thank you. you're welcome. All right. Uh, a couple of more highlights um, that Scott didn't touch that I think are really important. One, uh, we have an open space conservation program, um, and thank you all for um, supporting it in the last bond. Um, that program has $15 million to acquire open space for outdoor uh, recreation. Um, um, I was privileged to be able to approve um, the Rock Creek Ranch Park, but Parks Team did all of the work for that. Um, it's 290 acres worth of park right here in District 6. Um, and it's going to be a beautiful amenity for all of our residents and it's uh, right down the road So that's one highlight. I'm um, also see some of my young people here um, um, Our office worked with our fellow colleagues um, to ensure that no kid has to pay a membership fee for community centers I um, mean so if your kid does not have a community center uh, card um, You definitely need to get that and speaking of cards Manya Shore is here in the front Do you mind giving a quick plug for the new library? 
Um, we have a new library right down the road, and so please yes, come up. And then you. we'll bring up public engagement right after yeah, that. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, Council Member. And for the last minute ad, how many of you know there is a brand new library coming to District 6 about a mile away from here? Oh, that is not nearly enough people. <laughs> Well, you all approved it as part of the 2018 bond. <laughs> and we've been designing and building it ever since. It is called the Vivian J. Lincoln Library, named after a very well-known Crowley ISD educator. And it's going to open this summer. We should have the date very shortly. We're just trying to coordinate with the council member's calendar to make sure he can be there. So it should be very soon that we can tell you the date for the ribbon cutting. It will be a Saturday morning. So I hope you and your families can come. This library is not just going to have books like you would expect. It's going to have uh, a large meeting room, so we can have meetings like this there, conference rooms, study rooms, and it's going to have what we're calling our first wet room, which is a room for messy crafts. So it's going to have a drain in the middle of the floor, and all the electrical is raised up so we can get messy with our kids and adult programs and then just hose it down afterwards. We're also working with Crowley ISD on a reading program leading up to the ribbon cutting. So if you have kids in Crowley ISD, I hope you'll participate in that reading program. Thank you so much. The address is at the corner of Reisinger and McCart. I don't actually know if we have an address yet. They, I don't know. They don't always assign an address until after the building's completed, but it is going to be right across the street from the new uh, South Patrol Division. So that whole corner, which is now just fields, is going to be activated and lit up with uh, your city services. Thank you for having me. I'm just so proud of the naming process for the library. It um, was very, very public and transparent, um, and the public, uh, our community named uh, the library. More than 5,000 um, District 6 residents, I believe, participated um, in naming the library. And so that is a huge success for us and um, well deserved for uh, Ms. Lincoln. She was a beloved principal um, for a lot of us who came through the district. And so um, what an incredible honor. I hate she's not here to see it, but her family is really, really excited about it. So thank you. Um, our last presentation for the evening is public engagement. Um, and we have Michelle here who will give you all a briefing on if you see something, how to say something. So come on up. Thank you for inviting us tonight. I have three handouts at my um, table that I encourage you to come and get. The first one has to do with the 2023 election. As everybody knows, we have an election coming up on 6 May. Early voting starts on the 24th of April. Um, in the city of Fort Worth, with the addition of two districts and the redistricting that happened, 39% of the residents are changing districts. And so we have a page on our website. Um, you can get to it if you go to the website and just put 2023 election. And on that page, it has tools that will help you figure out where your district is, um, where you can vote, and um, the deadline has already passed to register to vote. So if you didn't do that, it's too late. But um, we also have information on just where you can check to make sure that you are registered so that you don't show up and then find out the hard way that you're not. Um, so I would encourage everybody to visit that and use the tool. It's really, it's a very cool tool. You slide it and it'll show the old districts and the new districts on the map. So it's a way to see just how the city is changing as a result of the recent redistricting. Um, another handout that I have is on the My Fort Worth app. How many of you have the app and use the app? Yay. Okay, um, we just did an upgrade. So um, the handout I have looks a little bit different than the app looks now. If you have the app and you haven't used it for a while, you need to do the upgrade. Um, I, it takes some people a little bit of time to get used to the new one, but I think you'll find it, it's much easier to use in the end. We have a lot more um, service requests that you can put in. For those of you that use the app, use the app, you know that when you enter it in, if you give us your contact information, you get updates on the request so you know if it was closed out, if it was fixed. Um, I know that sometimes people get a message that says an item is closed. And what happens is we've moved it to our work order system and it automatically sends a message that says closed. We're working on that messaging so that you'll get a message that says, 
we're working on this, we'll let you know when it's finally done. So that's something that we're aware of, we're working on, but anything that you encounter when you're using the app, if you like it, if you don't like it, let us know because we're always improving it. We do about four upgrades a year. So um, we definitely wanna hear from you. I may steal your see something, say something, so the city can do something. So if you all see that on a promotional item, you'll know where it came from. Um, so um, yes, I encourage everybody to use the app. And then um, if you don't like to use the app, you can also call our call center. You can report on the web. And all of this goes into the same work order system. So no matter how you enter in the request, it goes into the same system and goes directly to the department to solve it. We also have chat on a lot of our web pages. You can text, you can text hello to 817-835-MYFW, my Fort Worth, and that allows you to enter it through text. So no matter how you wanna report an issue to the city, we have tried to make it as easy as possible so that we can get the information directly to the department and then fix whatever the issue is. And the final thing that's on the handout I have in the back is one address. Um, it's a tool that we have on our website and you enter your address in, it will give you um, crime information, code violations, permits that have been issued around your address that you enter. Um, it'll tell you who your council member is, your district. Um, that's another place where you can see where your current district is and where your future district is if it's changing. Um, any other, like your neighborhood association, um, all the different things that have to do with your address, you can find in this one place. So um, we encourage you to use that. You can also find the NPO and uh, code officer. So um, just some tools that we have on the website. We're trying to put as much information out there so that we're as transparent and accessible as possible. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes. Hey, Michelle, um, on the associations that are listed, and <laughs> ours is not, is there something the association has to do to get listed? Yes, we have a registration process. And so what we do is we ask for a point of contact, we ask for copies of your bylaws, and then um, every year you have to do like an annual update. Really that's just to update contact information. So I'll give you my card and then we can we can see about getting you registered and on the, on the database. And that database is important because Internal city departments use that to get out information on zoning cases or, or other things that are happening. So um, if you're in a neighborhood association, you're interested in being registered, just let me know and we can help you do that. Anything else? All right, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And just to follow up on that, please, please, please make sure you all register. Um, that's really important, especially for the zoning process. And for District 6, we have a lot of cases. Um, and I think it's really important um, for us that we engage our neighbors during the zoning process. And so having that information helps us better um, get in contact with you all and get the developers in contact with you as well. Um, we're also working on a feature and we submitted a report um, for a request for a report from staff where individual residents can also subscribe for things like zoning alerts. So um, as much as you can subscribe to things on the city website, it's really, really helpful to get for us to help get the word out to you about important updates. Um, the last thing um, I want to do before we open the house back up for a brief period is to call AJ up. Um, AJ, will you come up here for a second? So AJ, thank you for the question you asked. Um, donuts and intersections are something that's really important to me. Um, my team is gonna follow up with you about which streets that we make sure that we know exactly where you're concerned about. Is that okay? Yes. Cool. I also have a Molly pin for you. Um, this is the official pin of the city of Fort Worth. Um, it's a reminder that um, the city is also yours and that uh, you have a responsibility to the city as well to be a good steward of it and to make a difference in it. Does that sound good? Cool. Well, here's your lapel. Thank you. Enjoy it, okay? Um, with that being said, that is the end of um, our program, and we are three minutes early. How did that happen? <laughs>
Um, so we have um, a bit of extra time. Um, thank you all um, in the back who are tabling. Um, it's so important for our residents to be able to connect with you. And also thank you for the service that you provide to the city. Um, it doesn't go unnoticed um, and it's, um, it definitely makes our city what it is today. So please make sure you connect with those folks if you have questions that we didn't get to answer. Make sure you get their contact info. Um, Joshua Rivers um, is in our office. He has his cards as well. So please, please, please get his contact as well so that you can connect with us again. Um, thank you all and have a blessed night. Take care.